Good Hello. afternoon and welcome to the Ocean Future Society Virtual Film Festival live Q&A for Jean-Michel Cousteau's Secret Ocean. I'm Jim Knowlton, I'll be your host. Today we also celebrate Earth Day. Earth Day is the day we recognize that the ocean and our ocean planet day. is our life support system. <laughs> it's Ocean Day. That's right. Earth Day is Ocean Day. 70% and percent of the earth is the ocean. <laughs> today is the day we recognize and uh, that, that uh, environmental protection is important for every day and that we realize that everybody can make a difference. A bit about our film Secret Ocean. Secret Ocean is an IMAX film that played in theaters around the world. And Secret Ocean presents in ultra high definition super detailed images with great colors of tiny sea life, some as big as a grain of rice or an eraser head on your pencil. The hope is that by looking at these tiny creatures in a way that's never been done before, to see the ocean in a new way with new technology, that you will fall in love with these little creatures and help protect them too. And as we'll find out today with our esteemed speakers, that the little creatures in the ocean are essential for all life in the ocean and on earth. So with that, let me introduce our speakers today. We're very lucky to have three passionate voices for the ocean. We have Jean-Michel Cousteau, the president of Ocean Future Society. He's the director of Secret Ocean. We have Dr. Sylvia Earle, who's the founder of Mission Blue, she is a National Geographic Explorer residence, uh, Explorer in Residence, and she's the narrator of Secret Ocean. We have Holly Loheis, who's a naturalist and marine biologist. She's been Jean-Michel Cousteau's dive buddy for 25 years, and she's in Secret Ocean. So with that, welcome everybody and happy Earth Day. Does anybody have any opening thoughts about uh, this important day that we recognize called Earth Day? <laughs> we just heard Jean-Michel jump in and say it's Ocean Day because most of Earth is blue. It's, it's about the ocean. Well, I think uh, <laughs> yeah, and I and all of you, we, we've agreed on that for a long time. But the good news is that now, we know that, for example, there is a major effort on the part of the decision makers of the world, including the president of this country, to protect the earth, to protect the ocean, and do 30% of protection entirely between now and, let's say, uh, 20 years or 30 years from now. So the other good news, I think, is the connection between climate and the ocean that has, it's, it's been obvious if you ask the earth, there is no climate without the ocean. The ocean drives climate and weather. And it's the living ocean. It's not just rocks and water. And it's becoming recognized. Today, Earth Day 2021, the president of the United States has convened leaders from around the world to look at the climate issues. And John Kerry has been appointed the international lead for climate issues for the United States. And he says that if you want to protect the ocean, you have to address the climate. If you want to address the climate, you must protect the ocean. Like, yes. So cause for hope. I'm, I'm stoked. <laughs> That's great. Well, we need action, action, action. And those people can make that happen. We are there to help, to assist, and do everything we can to uh, uh, avoid the past and to look the future so we can tell our children and grandchildren we're doing everything we can so you have the same privilege that we have had when you were a kid. You know, I, I, heard, I heard your father say, Jean-Michel, 
that he could not take you to places that he knew as a child because things had changed so much. And now I've heard you say the same thing, that your children in your lifetime, you've witnessed change to the, such a magnitude that places that you knew and loved as a child are not the same. Things are lost. But now we know. And Holly, you know, you've been a witness. You're out there splashing around, <laughs> taking care of the place. Wow. This is my, my life dream right here to be on screen with both of you. So thank you, Sylvia and Jean-Michel. And I wish you could have been with me yesterday. We have much to celebrate and some great conservation when it comes to the ocean. In just the last 25 years, I've known both of you. So I was out at the Channel Islands National Park yesterday on the backside of Anacapa and was surrounded by humpback whales and <sighs> amazing feeding frenzy with thousands of common dolphins and seabirds. So I think of both of you every time I'm out on the water and just celebrating what we have off the coast here of California. So it's great to be here with both of you on this beautiful ocean day of Earth Day and to really share with the audience the beautiful secret ocean and start off with sharks and with sharks, but really highlight just some of the smallest of animals that we all depend on when it comes to sustaining all life on our planet of healthy oceans. So I'm, I'm sure to dive right in. <laughs> I'm sure that uh, Sylvia and I, when we were kids, we were making mistakes. Uh, with the ocean because we didn't know anything and uh, now there's no excuse because thanks to what I call the communication revolution we are able to see things that we have never seen when we were kids and we were making mistakes about it but uh, we're living a very exciting time and Holly as a young scientist uh, she can communicate with the decision makers of tomorrow in schools and museums. And I know you do that all the time and in the shows that we produce and having had the privilege of uh, being connected to Sylvia for so long and Sylvia helping Ocean Futures and so on, uh, being on the board, uh, I'm grateful and I will never give up. And since uh, you given me the time to speak, I tell you in a couple of months or so, because next month is my birthday. <laughs> and I was being thrown away, thrown into the ocean when I was seven. I'm going to celebrate my 75th birthday of scuba diving. <laughs> and all the scuba diver still alive and diving. So I, I'm very excited and I have big responsibility and I want to share that with as many people as I can. And uh, so, Thank you very, very much. We are both truly ocean elders. I mean, <laughs> we're in that little group of people known as the ocean elders, but we, uh, we have a responsibility based on our lifetime of being witnesses. And even in Holly's lifetime, a witness to change as never before of loss, but also we know that when you protect the ocean, we give it a chance. Recovery is possible. And you protect yourself. Yes. <laughs> Great opening comments. I know we're going to have lots more. So I think maybe if we play our first clip from the film, just to kind of start getting into it. Beneath the ocean's surface is a universe of drifting and wandering organisms, plankton. Life as we know it depends on plankton, not just for the ocean, but for the planet. The larger particles are animals, or zooplankton, and the tiniest are plants, called phytoplankton. Phytoplankton play a vital role for our planet because through photosynthesis, they produce more than half the oxygen on Earth. So, every other breath we take, is a gift from the sea. Well, it's the largest migration that has ever taken place and never will take place. And we completely connected to these tiny little plants, which uh, we, when you go diving, you don't see them because they go down, down, down. 
and uh, you have to go diving at night to see them coming back up, just like we saw on the, these images. And that to me is a privilege to see how connected animals and plants are in the ocean. And we all connected to that. So it's fascinating. Oh, we lost you. We need submarines, Jean-Michel. Your dad was a pioneer in the diving saucer, going down into the depths and to go where those migrating hordes go. The phytoplankton that gathers sunlight and generates oxygen and captures the carbon, drives the great ocean food webs, and then the zooplankton, as you point out, sinks down into the depths, a thousand meters down, deeper than we can go even with scuba, let alone holding our breath. But whales go there, sharks go there, tuna go there. This is the this is like a big buffet in the ocean, out on the high seas as well as in coastal waters. And the thing is, most people have been oblivious to it until late in the 20th century. And even now, who knew? Who knows? Some of us know. You know. Holly knows. We've got to spread the word. We've got to take care of this buffet because it's the big carbon sink. It's the cycle of life. It's a nutrient cycle that we know how to, we know how to wreck it, <laughs> we know how to break it. We know how to extract from the ocean, but the connection to climate, I think is what is one of the big headlines of this decade. The living ocean, capturing carbon, generating oxygen, sequestering carbon. We look at trees, that's what trees do and other vegetation on the land, generating oxygen, capturing carbon, feeding life on the land and sequestering the carbon in the soil. But it's the ocean that does the heavy lifting for this, this, you know, follow the carbon, look at the ocean. Yeah, <laughs> fascinating. That was a, a beautiful sequence we filmed right off of Nemena Island and in Fiji, that one sequence that we just saw. But Jean-Michel, we always, always love to get the team all suited up after dinner when we're out on expedition and go right underwater at night. And we've done that many times in many places around the world, whether we're in the temperate waters right offshore of California or in the tropics there in Fiji to see all those gelatinous animals, it's like water alive. And uh, Sylvia so beautifully said, it's so important to the whole carbon cycle. So to witness that on every night dive, we were, what I think we're over a depth of well over a hundred foot depth below us, drifting off of Nemena Island. And with Gavin McKinney, our director of photography and Jean-Jacques Montello and, and Francois Montello using fancy lights, um, it was really beautiful to bring all those gelatinous animals to life because it is the foundation of all life on our planet. So such a beautiful opening sequence of Secret Ocean. Well, I love diving at night. Some people are initially kind of wary, <laughs> scary out there at night, but mm -hmm. once you're in it, you, know, you don't want to come out. Mm -hmm. And it's the closest thing that divers using scuba can experience to be what it's like a thousand meters or even a hundred meters beneath the surface where few divers can actually go. And to witness this spectacular kind of life that you, you generally don't see in sunlit times in shallow water. It, I mean, I think it brings home the reality that most of life on earth lives in the dark all of the time, below 100 meters, so certainly below 1,000 meters. The average depth of the ocean is 4,000 meters. And the maximum, of course, it's 11,000, seven miles down. Yeah. That's where life is. That's where most of life on Earth actually dwells. And yeah. we're, just, we're just nibbling at the surface. And we're the beneficiaries of all that life. We're just beginning to get to know it. Well, at the same time, we have to understand that because of uh, that situation, everything else uh, in the shallow waters uh, or even on land is connected. Right. It's one system. So, Jim, 
What do you think? I think we should play another clip. I know why. <laughs> and I had the pleasure of going there with Holly. Oh, look at this. Since the 1950s, my father and I have dedicated our lives to the ocean. On board Calypso and Alcyon, we explored the oceans of the planet and first fell in love with the larger animals, like whales, dolphins, and sharks. But what we often didn't see is a secret world that is perhaps the biggest story of all, that the smallest life in the sea is the foundation for the biggest. It's a view of the ocean my father could only have imagined, to see up close the details of what it's like to be a creature of the sea. This is the only way we can be connected to the old system that we are dealing with. And uh, Secret Ocean is bringing this to our attention because these groupers, and i have it's my favorite fish, uh, by the way, uh, they, uh, the, the females are living in one place and then at some time, uh, when it's the right time of the year, they all go somewhere with the other groupers and they mate and they uh, literally uh, create uh, fertilized eggs which they release and the current takes it away. And that's what the Goliath grouper, which is the biggest fish or biggest grouper, can be up to uh, 800 pounds. Uh, <laughs> and of course, the fisherman wants to catch them. And of course, there's a time where they come to mate and that's where you may have a, all the way up to a hundred groupers. They want to capture them and make a lot of money by selling it to, to us. Well, that species in the process of disappearing because we're taking more than they can reproduce themselves. And where these eggs, which are being fertilized and are now floating and drifting and being eaten along the way, but ultimately they find their way into the, uh, uh, the, the plants along the coastline. And uh, that's where they hide for uh, being protected and finding food. And they may spend two, three years uh, before they venture out of there. And those coastlines uh, need to be protected. These fish cannot be fished the way we fish them. Uh, that, that is a, an issue that is being addressed and it's very symbolic of any species on the planet, whether it's on land or in the ocean. Uh, every species is a capital and we cannot take more than the interest produced by the capital. Otherwise, we're going toward bankruptcy. And every time you look at species, the system becomes a little weaker and a little weaker. And at the end of the day, uh, we may uh, get in real trouble as a species ourselves. So we, uh, we're fascinated by all these tiny little creatures that we were able, thanks to the new technology that exists, to approach, look at them, study them, understand their behavior, and so on. So sorry, but I, I'm so emotional about this whole issue that I wanted to share that with everyone who's listening. You, know, you should know that in Florida, the Goliath grouper, the biggest of the groupers, 800 pounds, it's like the 800 pound gorilla. This is the 800 pound fish. You'd think that they'd be safe, but they're particularly singled out because they are a big iconic species. And to consider opening up them for fishing of any sort is just wrong. I hope people will rise up and just defend the Goliath groupers and have a permanent protection for them. They're so important to the health of the reef. The, if you saw the cycle of life. It's the phytoplankton, zooplankton, little fish eaten by the bigger fish, but the big fish give back nutrients. All the creatures do. They keep the system healthy. The phytoplankton need nutrients too. So thank you, Goliath grouper. You carry a lot of nutrients around with you, like whales that 
capture carbon, store carbon over long periods of time, like vegetation on the land. Yeah. It starts with photosynthesis, but it winds up stored in all forms of life. So it's a climate connection that we're beginning to understand. Taking care of Goliath groupers means taking care of all the groupers, really, taking care of the reefs and ultimately taking care of us. Well, that's why the reefs are so important. And Holly and I, we have done a lot of diving in shallow waters, looking at what's happening in the reef. You want to say something, yes, Holly? I just want to say, Jean-Michel, because both you and, and Sylvia are such important advocates for shark conservation too. Yeah. And that sequence where we're diving with the Caribbean reef sharks, and especially when that was screened on 3D and an IMAX screen, um, it really gave people a sense of that intimate connection that we feel very fortunate to have that opportunity to dive with sharks, but not everybody does. So I think this type of film that shows a sequence with us as divers immersed with hundreds of Caribbean reef sharks really shows that we could have this intimate interaction in a very respectful way. And to be diving there in Bahamas where sharks are protected, we see that ecologically they play such an important role in maintaining the balance of coral reefs there in the Bahamas as well as around the world but also it's for the tourist opportunity. It's one of the best places where divers could go and have these incredible interactions in a very eco-friendly way. So I'm so happy that, you know, in a short film, we can't really cover all that information, but it's something we as Ocean Futures Society has written blogs and articles about where divers could have that interaction and really become those shark protectors that we all need to do. Jim? Yes, so let's play a clip, and, uh, and this clip especially shows the tiny creatures on the reef and the diversity, so let's play clip number three. I find it fascinating. Thousands of gobies and blennies hide on the reef, many less than half an inch long. More than one third of all fish on some reefs are gobies, an important source of food to larger fish. So they have to hide from predators. One vigilant goby even has a blind shrimp for roommate who digs the burrow in return for protection. This reef is like a crowded condominium of nosy neighbors, all hiding and waiting for a meal to pass by. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm like amazed a, that- Like uh, a crowded know, condominium. Having a shrimp and a fish having a relationship which is critical, I found that fascinating. And uh, they protect each other, allowed to feed each other, and so that's amazing. And uh, every time I go, and you know, people ask me all the time and say, what is your best dive? And I always tell them the next one, because we <laughs> find things we've never seen before. Always. <laughs> and often, not by tearing around at high speed to see as much as possible, as quickly as possible. I mean, you're always kind of on a deadline, but the just sitting quietly and allowing the creatures to come out and, and approach you. That happens with those big fish as well as the little ones, that if you, if you don't seem as though you're a threat, if you just settle in and become a part of the reef, you can see amazing things, just as you can when you go into a forest. If you sit quietly, birds come out and you can see them. And otherwise, you just might miss the best. Yeah. Well, I'm not surprised because, you know, I'm sorry to go back to that. But when I was with the Goliath Groupers at the time where they uh, reproduce, there were millions of little fish <laughs> around them because when they are in the process of reproducing, they don't feed themselves. So there's millions of little fish were hiding there to be protected from other creatures that would eat them normally. 
And uh, <laughs> that to me is amazing. Is, it's it's exactly the same thing there. There's no such thing as a dumb fish. <laughs> they know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> and especially in that sequence with the goby and the blind shrimp. Oh. And it took both Jean-Michel and Dr. Richard Murphy, who is Jean-Michel's senior marine scientist and has been for, gosh, over 50 years. When Murphy first pointed that out to me on the reefs of Fiji, right off shore there from um, the resort that we visit all the time, the Jean-Michel Cousteau Fiji Island Resort. And when they pointed it out, Murphy said, don't take your eyes off the shrimp because you'll see he always has an antenna touching the fish. That's and right. they're in constant touch. And that is their way of communicating between the shrimp being blind and the fish being a little lazy. The shrimp <laughs> is doing all the work. And it's, as you mentioned, Sylvia, it's just taking the time and looking and staying still, especially when you're diving and you just see these elaborate, really complicated relationships of animals that depend on each other, just as we depend on each other. So it's a beautiful little sequence and reminds us of all those important relationships. So Darwin's great theme was survival of the fittest, that there's a great competition always going on out there in the natural world and in the human society as well. And it's true, there is some of that, but Lynn Margulis, who came along a little bit later <laughs> and looked at life a little bit differently, acknowledges the reality that, that we now can see that the great progression of, of life on earth has happened more from collaboration, from cooperation, from working together as a system than this idea that it's always, you know, kill and be killed or be killed. There is some of that, but by far the dominant way that society in the ocean, life in the ocean has progressed over time and on land as well, even in the roots of trees, there is a system going on with fungi and bacteria and earthworms and nematodes. It's, it's not just rocks, tree and water, it's this whole ecosystem. And looking at a coral reef, you can see collaboration, cooperation within the corals themselves, the little algae that live within the tissues, they now need each other. How that evolved over time, we don't know, but it was cooperation that really spelled success. That's great. Jim? How about another clip? All right. I love this. This film is so amazing. <laughs> Vast though it is, the ocean is in a delicate balance where even the smallest creatures play a big role and need protection. When we damage the ecosystem, even for a single species, many things can go wrong. That's what we learn when we unknowingly turn a magnificent sea star into a monster. We overfished its predators, and young sea stars eat abundant phytoplankton fertilized by land pollution, so the population explodes. It's an armored attack that we can't yet stop. It's one of many examples of where we disrupt the system and that change is not favorable to the life there and it's not favorable in the end to us either. But now we know, as Jean Michel said, we don't have an excuse anymore. <laughs> oh, we don't. <laughs> One thing that, whether it's the Goliath grouper or sharks, Holly, you mentioned, being able to go to places, still go to places in the ocean where sharks are relatively abundant, but literally 90% of most of the big sharks are gone and some of them have been reduced down to 1% of what, what was there when Jean Michel and I were kids. I mean, the, the idea that we have the power to kill and eliminate whole categories of life. Some of it we're doing deliberately, like when I was a kid, People thought the only good shark was a dead shark. And so we deliberately went out to, to kill them, thinking it was a good thing to do that. Now, 
and I was told you got to be afraid of the man eaters. Holly and I don't have to worry about man eating sharks. You know, we're safe. <laughs> you have to worry. You're a guy, but, <laughs> but you know. actually, we have to worry now because seeing a reef where there are no sharks we, we need to worry about the absence of sharks the ocean needs them needs the big grouper needs the big snapper needs the needs everything needs the little fish but if, you, if you're going to save an elephant you have to save the system that supports the elephant and the same is true with whales if you want to save a whale or a goliath or a shark it means You've got to save the system and that's where we're at right now trying to save big chunks of the ocean to restore at least some of what we've lost yeah well you know i remember 40 years ago i was diving with great white sharks i was swimming with the great white sharks i was grabbing on the dorsal fin of the female I've seen and those pictures. <laughs> it would take me for a ride. Now, people, you, when you talk about great white sharks, people don't know where to find them. Yeah. Because there's almost very, very few left. And I, I don't know where they are, but uh, it, it's a real issue. And we need to understand that as we continue to losing all these creatures, it's weakening the system. And it's directly related to uh, what we're talking about today, whether it's the climate change or whatever, is, is connected to the impact that we have on nature. And we need to better understand. And uh, thanks to uh, the communication and the school systems and the teachers, I think we're making some progress, but we have a long way to go still. Yes, we do. And, and to that last little clip that you showed, I think I used the words to describe the crown of thorns starfish to characterize them as, as monsters, but actually we're the monsters, if anybody. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> it's not their fault. We change the system. They're just doing what they do. The same is true with lionfish. Uh, we alter the system. We introduce them to a place they've never been before. We've removed their natural predators or the animals that would normally mow them down before they get a chance to get in, really installed as a major feature. So what do we do, Jean-Michel and Holly? What, what is, what's the best way to cope with where we are? I mean, I see knowledge is the key. How do we get people to want that knowledge and then in, have it change the way they think about the future? Well, I think, and Holly, I, I definitely want you to uh, <laughs> tell us, but uh, personally, I, I really believe we need education, education, and we need to sit down with decision makers, including people who depend upon these resources for their survival of to feed their families or whatever. I know it's very difficult and very complex. And when we're going to show in a minute uh, the uh, the lionfish and the fact that uh, you introduce a lionfish in the wrong place, and in uh, one hour they can eat four uh, forty fish, little fish, uh, and that's the consequences. And it's our fault. We made a mistake. So. Holly, what do we do with science and education? Um, how long do I have to tell? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jean-Michel, your father used to always say people protect what they love. And you and Sylvia have just been such an inspiration to encourage people to go out and see for themselves. So it's that intimate connection, people going out on a whale watching trip or hiking on isolated islands or putting a mask and snorkel and seeing for themselves the giant kelp forests or the coral reefs. They have to see it. And I think with that, that connection, people then feel motivated. They feel empowered to then, what can I do? I could minimize my single use plastic. I could support sustainable seafood, support the local fisher folks in your own community. Um, there's just, and reduce your carbon footprint is huge. So 
I think there's some really, especially on a day like today of, of celebrating our earth, we have to instill a sense that people have the power to make some pretty instrumental choices to really um, create a more sustainable future. So using the lessons from nature and looking at these connections, the crown of thorns is a great reminder that it's what we did on land of overdevelopment, land-based pollution that provided the nutrients for the little crown of thorn larvae to survive. And then that population exploded because we overfished the predator. So it's looking at these simple lessons from nature and how we can restore what we've done wrong. So thanks to science, we do really have a great understanding and we've got the technology. We now just, as you always say, Jean-Michel, we need the action. And that starts with those young leaders of tomorrow and getting them outside and in the water for sure. And it's very difficult because 60% of the population lives away from the ocean. And many of them have never been in the ocean. So we have to reach out to them, we have to make sure we provide them the, with all the information that is available today and ultimately makes a way to have them go to see it for themselves. Uh, how can you protect what you don't understand? And you have to understand. And uh, I think we have a, a huge opportunity today, which we didn't have before. And uh, I, I, uh, I, I'm excited on one hand. On the other hand, uh, time is of the issue. And uh, that's why showing images uh, to a lot of people who haven't had the privilege that we have spending days and years underwater uh, to show them some of those stories. And that's why the, uh, uh, the lionfish to me is a perfect example where we made a mistake and uh, it has a huge impact. And I don't know if you want Jim to show that very, very short video, but let's do that before we close the program. There we go. Well, we won't be closing the program as much as starting our Q and A and there are, there are questions piling up. So uh, let's play this clip and then we'll take some questions after a discussion. And thanks to Sylvia's narration And its elegant fins are a cloak to herd and trap small fish. It's a superb predator. And now, it's an alien invader. One large lionfish can consume 40 fish an hour. The lionfish was brought from the Pacific for aquariums and accidentally released onto Caribbean reefs, where we have depleted the large predatory fish that could naturally control them. We're learning that our mistakes can have enormous consequences. What a fascinating to, uh, creature. I wanted to take a moment just to point out the incredible videography that is in this film, because uh, these images of this fish, which is on average about six inches long, <laughs> and if you see some of these pictures, uh, just such amazing detail, ultra high definition close-ups um, that the Montello brothers, the producers of um, this program of 3D entertainment and their uh, director of photography Gavin McKinney present for us is just incredible. And also the writer, our writer, Pam Stacy for this film that, uh, that helped write the script. I, I want to take this moment to apologize to the lionfish for highlighting the fact that sometimes a big lionfish can consume as many as 40 little fish in an hour because compared to an industrial fishing fleet, what a lionfish takes is nothing. These <laughs> large scale fishers have huge nets that not only take everything in their pathway, 
they take the whole ecosystem. It's like taking the whole coral reef because you want the parrotfish. I mean, and, and what you leave behind is rubble. At least the lionfish, it's not their fault. They're doing what they're doing. And eventually they'll find their place. I don't think we'll ever totally see the end of lionfish in, in a part of the world that they did not occupy until we opened the door for them and took away the big predators that normally would have probably kept them in pretty low numbers. But here we are, we have what we have and protecting the intact systems wherever they are in the Caribbean, all over the world. These, I call them hope spots. And, and that's part of what I'm doing. I know Jean-Michel, Holly, it's, it's now this movement to try to embrace as much of, of the land, as much of the ocean as possible to restore what we've lost largely in our lifetime. More lost, but at the same time, we've learned more. And it's the best yeah. time to really apply what we know and try to turn things around. That's the opportunity we have right now. Well, Earth Day for me is a great symbolic to uh, be able to reach out to as many people as we can, millions and millions and millions of people, for them to understand that uh, this is not just a, a birthday. It's, it's an event to share and understand that we are all connected to this planet and uh, we depend upon everything that is on it. And uh, it's a very exciting time. Uh, there's a lot to do, a lot to discover. There are probably, uh, I don't know, millions of species that we have yet to identify. And uh, so research is uh, very important and science is very critical. And I'm not a scientist, but Sylvia, Holly, thank you. Well, Jean-Michel, you underestimate your ability to observe carefully and report honestly, which is what a scientist does. And what you have observed and reported and shared, that's what scientists should do, to observe, report honestly what they see, and then share the view. If you keep it to yourself, it doesn't really <laughs> make any difference that you made this big discovery. It's the ability to take that knowledge and, and in, make it available to your fellow humans. It's the way we progress. Well, I didn't, uh, I wouldn't have this knowledge if you were not there. So <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. How about if we take some questions? Um, but let me start off by saying that we have many people tuned in from all over the world. And I asked some people where they're from. And uh, in some of the places are Germany, San Francisco, Idaho, North Carolina, Florida, Maui, Ohio, Maine, Michigan, <laughs> Alabama, Cozumel, Texas, Yucatan, Denver, Cardiff by the Sea, and St. Joseph, Michigan. Also, a special shout out to my high school friend, Julie Dudridge, because Mrs. Dudridge has her second grade class uh, with us today. Wonderful. So to answer all those questions, we need another five hours. <laughs> we do. We are, we are racing for time here. Uh, but uh, someone in Mrs. Dudridge's class asks, are there any vegetarian sharks? I don't know of any vegetarian sharks, but that's okay. You know, it's in the ocean, it's an eat and be eaten world and it works over the ages. You know, I don't eat animals, but animals that eat animals are part of the system. Consider whales that eat zooplankton, eat little shrimp, those little shrimp are animals too, of course. They have consumed the phytoplankton, but at every step, there's a place. It's a harmony, they give back. The little shrimp give nutrients back, the whales give a lot back to power the phytoplankton. And there is no waste, there is no excess in nature. We've introduced those concepts in human society 
we create a lot of waste. And we think somehow that there's an excess in the ocean just waiting for us to go take. But, you know, we've got to find our place within the systems that, that thrive there. It's okay for an orca to eat fish. They're allowed. I choose not to do that. <laughs> I want to point out, Jim, for all of the educators listening in, one of the post projects of this beautiful film, Secret Ocean, was working with the education team under Jean-Michel and oh. Dr. Richard Murphy. And um, we've developed this guide that's available. It's a PDF that's downloadable for free on the Ocean Features website, as well as the Secret Ocean website. And that's what we want to do is for second graders to ask such great questions like that. And there's some fantastic information in here about survival and partnerships and ecosystem functions of ecosystems. So um, encourage everybody to really take a deeper dive into some of those topics that we're talking about here and that we just briefly mentioned in the films. Polly, I just presented that on our uh, chat that Great. the viewers are typing in their questions on. Great, thank you. Thank so you. we're very fortunate to have Dr. Bill Bushing with us today. Oh, and yeah. he points out, hey, Dr. Yeah. Bill. Dr. Bill living on Catalina Island and, and uh, giving us great info from Catalina Island on a regular basis. He points out that when he first moved to Catalina, blue sharks were everywhere. And, and I know that when I was back with Island Packers, we could see the blue sharks sitting on the top of the water. You could point them out easily. It seemed like every mile was a basking blue shark. And now it would be like, not at all not even once a year would you see a blue shark oh. sitting on the surface. And, and clearly that's because of, uh, you know, long lining and gill netting all over the world. Um, but if you guys have a comment about that for Dr. Bill. Well, I can dive in if you will. We're so good at killing. We, we have the capacity to eliminate whole categories of life. And there was a time when we thought this was maybe a good idea but now we know there is no excuse for killing sharks. I think sharks, I personally, based on the science of the ocean and how it functions, there's no excuse for anyone to kill a shark. People historically haven't eaten sharks. It's not a source of food and a luxury choice to cut off their fins and make a soup out of the fins and throw the shark away. I mean, it's just, it's scandalous that we actually have grown up in a society where this is acceptable. Actually, it's not acceptable. And we need to, we need to change it. We need to protect, protect the ocean and the creatures who live there as if our lives depend on it because they do. That's right. I don't get it, so. I would like to ask Bill though at Catalina, because for me in the Northern Channel Islands, like you, Jim, working on the island packer boats, I see a lot more leopard sharks now than I did back in the 90s. So they might not be the top apex predators like white sharks and blue sharks, but we do have such a diversity of sharks offshore. And as we do have a large network of marine protected areas around the Channel Islands, thanks to a collaborative effort of multiple agencies and NGOs and voices like Sylvie and Jean-Michel inspiring people that when we do protect small parts of the ocean, you get this spillover effect and just an increase of biodiversity and abundance that we've seen in just a short window of time around our own Channel Islands. So I do not see blue sharks on the island packer boats now at all. It's just very sad. But recently we've been having some amazing sightings of basking sharks that were not here back in the 80s and 90s. So I think those are the encouraging stories of stories of hope that we have to really highlight because we do have the ability to really bring back these ecosystems and these individual species. Well, could I just add that when I was, there, there, are, more, there are more whales today mm. than when I was a child, why? We stopped mm. killing them. Not 100%, but we've gone for, you know, looking at, at sharks, at, at looking at whales as commodities. They, the whalers saw whales as money. They saw whales 
as barrels of oil and pounds of meat. It's the way we look at fish today as money or as pounds of meat or oil that gets squeezed out of the fish. We don't look at them with a kind of affection that we've come to embrace for whales. But, you know, we know that when the killing stops, recovery is possible. More whales, they're not back to where they were a thousand years ago or even 500 years ago. But the same is true with turtles. Turtles are not fully protected in the ocean, but there's more protection today than when I was a child and there are more turtles today. The beaches are protected in many places and the turtles are looked at with affection instead of just mm, delicious. Maybe someday we'll look at sharks and Goliath grouper and maybe all the creatures in the sea with a kind of respect and dignity that we accord, that we should accord to all forms of life. Great. So we're very fortunate to have Abby Rogers with us today, who is an all-star young lady living in Maui, Hawaii, and who has uh, taken great interest in the ocean. So I want to give a shout out to Abby. And Abby asked a question, which I know we could talk about for probably three hours. Uh, so we'll have to do this one briefly if possible. But Abby says, I know there are many things that are hurting in the ocean. But what do you think are the three biggest threats to the ocean? It's ignorance. It's lack of knowing why people should care. Of course, what we're putting in, what we're taking out, big broad categories, all the plastics, all the chemical pollution, all the excess carbon dioxide that is changing the chemistry of the ocean, acidifying the ocean, and certainly what we're taking out that is altering the chemistry of the ocean the composition of this fabric of life. But overall, if we, if we really understood the consequences, not just to the fish, to the whales, to the ocean, but back to us and our survival, maybe we would behave differently than we are today. So I really celebrate what you're doing, Jean-Michel and Holly and Jim, and all of you out there who are ambassadors for the ocean. Fish are not voting. They're, they're not able to be at Oh, we lost her. We lost you. Your audio. But. Can we hear your, uh, I think we lost your volume, Sylvia. Then over oh, to you. Here you are. You're back. <laughs> over to you. Well, I, I just wondered that because Abby, I'm so fascinated. It's a young, young lady who came to one of my lectures uh, in Hawaii, in Maui, and uh, she asked me a million questions. <laughs> and uh, she wanted to get into the ocean, but she was not yet old enough to be certified. And she waited. And then one day, we got a communication telling us that she had reached to be 10 years old <laughs> and now she is certified as a scuba diver. And, and I am so fascinated. And to me, she recharged my batteries for I don't know how many more years that I'm going to be around to continue sharing this with those decision makers who are the ones who are gonna do a much, much better job than we were doing when I was her age. So I'm so excited and I'm so grateful. And I don't know if you want to add something, Holly, about uh, her questions. I think it's a great question, Abby. Thank you. And we could look at these big global issues, but really what's in your own backyard and lucky you to live on a beautiful tropical island. So taking advantage of you know, sharing your passion for the coral reefs and the humpback whales right offshore where you live, sharing it with your friends and family, encourage people to think about the daily choices they make because every action we do can have a positive or negative impact on the environment. So supporting, you know, eco-conscious companies, 
companies that do not wrap everything up in plastic, just the simple things that you buy at the grocery store or the clothes that you buy, and even the sunscreen you put on your face. So everything we do could really be supporting businesses that are trying to do their best to be eco-friendly. And you as a consumer, by buying that product, you're, you're voicing your, your importance, your, your care for nature. So we all, as Jean-Michel always says, and it's a beautiful quote in one of his films, is we just need to live in better balance with nature. We need to minimize our environmental footprint and think about the important habitat and ecosystems that surrounds us and celebrate the birds that might be nesting in your roof or celebrate the park that's a block away and the wildlife in that open space. And just the appreciate that we need more wilderness areas and for us to uh, do all we can to protect it. Abby, I want you to know, Nan and I are going to come to see you. <laughs> so that was great, Holly, because you talked about our choices and how they matter and what we buy and it makes a significant difference. So Mrs. Dudridge has a, a student with another question. And that is, what's your opinion about the sale of tropical fish and fish tanks? Lots of people don't know that, that's, that little saltwater fish are collected live out of the ocean. They're not bred in captivity. And that people go out and dump cyanide on reefs and collect fish and only a small percentage survive. And the ones that are shipped across seas then get into your tank and, and may or may not have what they need to live in their tank with the right food. You know, some of the, the tropical fish are now being raised. It's, it's actually a pretty big and thriving business. They're worth much more per pound than the fish that people eat. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. Taking the wildlife from the reefs, actually it's, it's a form of fishing that is targeted to the, the little guys that we've been celebrating during this, this hour. And you, you do just strip away important elements of what makes a reef healthy. You do it when you take the Goliath grouper, but you also do it when you take the little small fish that are every piece has a place, every, every life is interconnected to all the others. It's much better to find ways of, of taking yourself out to visit with them than to impose the grief that you do when you take them out of their home and, and bring them into a, a cage, if you will, an aquarium. Now, large aquariums have a place. Again, some are more respectful and, and treat fish as fish would like to be treated, the big public aquariums and serve as sources of information and get, you know, I consider them halfway houses for fish and having your own home aquarium where you actually see those little faces looking at you and you know, you have to take care of them. It gives you some insight into the cycle of life, but be mindful of what animals are adaptable to being taken as, as pets, I suppose you could say, as part of your household. And you have to really be mindful of, of the real cost. It's not just what you pay for them in the store. It's where, does this, where did this fish come from? What hole has been left in the system if it's taken from the wild? And maybe you'll choose to take yourself and out and visit with them instead of in bringing them <laughs> into a very alien environment. So true. So there's another question here and uh, another student in Mrs. Dudridge's class wants to know, Jean-Michel, how old were you when you first dived? I think I mentioned it earlier, but uh, it's a secret. <laughs> uh, at that time, certification uh, or to be certified as a scuba diver did not exist. My father and some engineers had co-invented the equipment and uh, they tested it and it worked. And then one day my dad said, well, you can't, you want to come with me? And uh, I was there with my mother, my brother, 
and my father, and he put a tank on my back, on my brother, who was younger than me, and my mother, who had tested the scuba diving uh, before, and uh, we took a dive, and we went diving. I was seven. Unfortunately, my brother is no longer here, but uh, he would have been the, the younger one since he was younger than me. But uh, I've never stopped and never will stop. And I think to have certification at the age of 10, uh, like Abby <laughs> in Maui, is perfect. And uh, it's, uh, uh, of course, very important that people learn what to do. And uh, I'll say one, one thing, never dive alone. A person alone is in bad company. <laughs> and uh, I've said that because if I had not been with a, a scientist in a cave watching blind fish, and there are fish that are blind because they don't need vision since it's all dark, and uh, I went out of air. Mm. And that scientist was there. I told him that I was running out, I was had no air, and we started sharing his air, and we walked or swam outside of that long uh, tunnel to come out and go back to the surface. I would have been dead if he had not been there. Mm. So never dive alone. Always have a colleague with you. So we are at the top of the hour, and uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us today in the audience and each of you uh, speakers as well. Does, everyone, uh, does anyone have a parting statement or thought for our viewers for Earth Day as we conclude our program? Earth Day is protect the ocean, and if you protect the ocean, you protect yourself. That's our mission at Ocean Futures. <laughs> the world is blue there it is that's right <laughs> <laughs> 71%. passionate so we're good at and share your skill you okay holly <laughs> we missed your button we missed your audio holly if you could just re-say that for us Sorry. yes um well, both Sylvia and Jean-Michel always inspire everybody that we all have our own individual skills. We all are good at something. So take what you love to do, computer graphics, ocean communication, education, photography, computer science, and just go out and share your, your love for the ocean and know that it takes us all to really work together to collaborate and be a wave of positive action when it comes to protecting this life support system of our amazing blue planet. Here's here. Sylvia, you've been and you are a treasure to the planet. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you. Back at you, both of you, all of you. Thank you for the chance to be here and celebrate. Thank you all so much. And if uh, everyone wants to see this film, go to the Ocean Future Society Virtual Film Festival, where you can watch Secret Ocean and other films. We appreciate everyone joining us today. Happy Earth Day, and thank you so much for your support. We'll now conclude the program. Thank you.